Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Do you love being chained to a hot stove when it's 107 degrees outside? Well, me neither. That's why HelloFresh has made special, limited time recipes for you to try out this summer. We're talking about specially curated summer delights that are going to make your mouth water. It's all there. And starting this month, that's August if you're watching from the future, HelloFresh is launching its Taste of Summer series. It's going to get you out of that steamy kitchen and outside for some grilling and farm fresh sides, succulent barbecue bundles, grillable protein, surf and turf, classic summertime desserts. Yum, yum, yum. This is just the latest development from HelloFresh, the meal kit service that's all about keeping your mealtime adventurous. They work with local farmers to send you delicious locally sourced meals that help you skip the meal prep and put dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. And HelloFresh is a perfect service because of its flexibility, but also because of its responsible business model. If you like variety, you're never going to be locked into any option. Change your preferences for a week if you want some spontaneity or add in some extra meals. Just go to HelloFresh.com and use code BRAINFOOD14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, 14 free meals at HelloFresh.com. Use the code BRAINFOOD14. And let's get into the video. It's one of the best-selling drugs in history. Since its introduction in 1998, it has swiftly become the flagship product for pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, ringing in sales of up to $2 billion every year. The United States, Mexico, and Canada spend more than $1.4 billion on it every year, while the US military alone shells out an astonishing $41.6 million annually to help its troops make G.I. Joe stand at attention. The blockbuster drug is, of course, Viagra. Yet, despite its enormous success, this little blue pill that top 62 million men worldwide get their Boy Scouts to pitch a tent almost never was, and owes its existence to an unlikely chain of historical events involving chest pains, an observant nurse, and a substance more closely associated with demolitions than erections. In 1846, German-Swiss chemist Christian Friedrich Schoenbein was experimenting in his kitchen in Basel when he accidentally spilt a mixture of sulfuric acid and nitric acid on the counter. He reached for the nearest cloth, a cotton apron, to wipe up the mess, then hung it up over the stove to dry. But as soon as the apron dried, it promptly exploded. Schoenbein had accidentally developed nitrocellulose, the world's first nitrate explosive. Over the next 100 years, nitrocellulose would revolutionize the world. In the form of gun cotton, it became the first practical replacement for gunpowder and firearms, while in 1869, American inventor John Wesley Hyatt would combine it with camphor to produce celluloid, the world's first commercially successful plastic. One of celluloid's most widespread uses was in movie film, though its extreme flammability led to countless theaters and film storehouses going up in flames until, starting in the 1950s, it was finally replaced by cellulose acetate, or safety film. The year after Schombein's discovery, Italian chemist Ascanio Sabero working under French chemist Theophile Jules Pelouz at the University of Turin combines the same nitric sulfuric acid mixture with glycerin to produce an oily liquid he called pyroglycerin, which soon became known as its more infamous name, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin was the world's first true high explosive. Unlike low explosives like gunpowder and nitrocellulose, which merely deflagrate or burn rapidly, high explosives like nitroglycerin detonate, chemically decomposing via an explosive shockwave that passes through the material at supersonic speeds. Nitroglycerin is thus able to deliver three times the energy of gunpowder, 25 times faster, making it far better suited to industrial blasting. But there is an enormous catch. Nitroglycerin is extremely unstable stable, readily detonating at the slightest shock. Even manufacturing nitroglycerin is highly dangerous. The reaction between glycerin, nitric, and sulfuric acid is exothermic, producing a large amount of heat that can detonate the explosive. Indeed, Sobrero was so frightened of his own invention that he warned vigorously against it being used industrially, arguing that it could never be safely controlled. But another of Pelos' students, Alfred Nobel, saw the enormous potential of nitroglycerin, and in 1864, he and his brother Emil refitted his family's defunct armaments factory in Hallenborg, Sweden, to manufacture the powerful new explosive. The Nobels introduced a number of innovations in an attempt to make nitroglycerin manufacturers safe. For example, factories were built on hillsides so the nitroglycerin could flow gently via gravity, avoiding the use of mechanical pumps which could set off the explosive. The ingredients themselves were mixed in large steel or lead vats, cooled with water and stirred with air to prevent the exothermic reaction from running away. If temperatures got too high, the bottom of the mat could be opened, safely dropping the batch into a large 
tank of cold water, a process known as drowning. Factory workers were even made to sit on one-legged stools to prevent them from falling asleep on the job. While the Nobel's product, which they trademarked blasting oil, was an instant commercial success, despite their best efforts, nitroglycerin remained a highly volatile and dangerous substance, resulting in countless accidents and deaths. This included a 1864 explosion that destroyed the Helenborg factory and killed Emil Nobel. In 1869, the explosion of two one-ton wagons of nitroglycerin in the village of Quimiaglo in Wales led the British government to pass the Nitroglycerin Act, banning the manufacture and transport of the explosive in the British Isles. Other countries soon followed suit. Faced with the loss of his brother and his livelihood, Alfred Nobel set out to find a means of taming nitroglycerin once and for all. After experimenting with wood, pulp, charcoal, cement, and other substances, in 1867, Nobel finally hit upon using Kaisel Gur, a type of chalky diatomaceous earth found near his factory in the Krumel Hills of Germany. Kaisel Gur absorbed the nitroglycerin to form a flexible, putty like substance that was insensitive to regular shocks and could only be set off with an explosive blasting cap, another of Nobel's inventions. Nobel named the new safety explosive dynamite. It was a runaway success, forever changing the face of construction, mining, and warfare, and making Nobel a very well. Man. In 1875, Nobel invented blasting gelatin, or gelignite, an even safer and more powerful mining explosive composed of nitroglycerin, wood pulp, and potassium nitrate, while in 1887 he patented ballastite, a smokeless propellant for rifles and artillery. In 1888, allegedly an erroneously published obituary describes Nobel as a merchant of death, accusing him of becoming rich by finding ways to kill people faster than ever before. This obituary supposedly disturbed Nobel so that in 1895 he bequeathed his vast fortune to find the creation of five Nobel Prizes, honoring important contributions to chemistry, physics, physiology, and medicine, literature, and peace. But while dynamite was considerably safer to use than liquid nitroglycerin, it still had its drawbacks. For example, improperly stored dynamite could sweat nitroglycerin, rendering it extremely unstable. There were also stranger effects. Exposure to dynamite and nitroglycerin, typically via absorption through the skin, induced severe headaches known to explosive workers as banghead. Indeed, this phenomenon was first described by the inventor of nitroglycerin, Ascanio Sabero, who in 1847 reported, a very minute quantity put on the tongue produced a violent headache for several hours. Regular exposure built up a tolerance, causing the headaches to taper off by the end of the work week. This tolerance, however, faded over the weekends, and workers returning to the factory the next week experienced a combination of dizziness, rapid heartbeat, and headaches known as Monday disease. Stranger still, workers suffering from angina pectoris, chest pain usually caused by constricted arteries in the heart, found that their symptoms disappeared during the work week, only to return on the weekend as Sunday heart attacks. These strange phenomena caught the attention of British physician William Murrell, who in 1878 began administering diluted preparations of nitroglycerin to patients suffering from angina and hypertension. The results of these experiments were promising, leading Morell to publish his findings in the medical journal The Lancet in 1879. Over the following decades, nitroglycerin was increasingly prescribed for all varieties of heart disease. It was even prescribed to Alfred Nobel a few months before his death in 1896, leading him to write, Isn't it the irony of fate that I have been prescribed nitroglycerin to be taken internally. They call it Trinitrin, so as not to scare the chemist and the public. Even today, nitroglycerin continues to be prescribed to patients suffering from angina, administered via injection pills, sublingual spray, or transdermal patch. In all cases, the active ingredient is diluted to a concentration of 1%, eliminating its explosive potential. But while 140 years of clinical experience has proven beyond a doubt that nitroglycerin does work, it is only fairly recently that scientists determined exactly how it works. At the time of Morell's experiments in 1878, many doctors believed that angina was caused by high blood pressure. However, Morell's work revealed that nitroglycerin could relieve chest pain even when the patient's blood pressure was normal. Murrell thus hypothesized that angina was instead caused by constricted blood vessels and that nitroglycerin worked by relaxing and expanding these vessels, a process known as vasodilation. A similar effect had previously been observed by English chemist Frederick Guthrie while working with a compound called amyl nitrate. In 1859, Guthrie reported that amyl nitrate when inhaled produced a lapse of about 50 seconds, a sudden throbbing of the arteries in the neck immediately followed by a flushing of neck, temples, and forehead, and an acceleration action of the heart. The observation led Scottish physician T. Lord of Brunton to develop amyl nitrate into the first effective drug for the treatment of hypertension and angina in 1867, a full decade ahead of William Murrell's use of nitroglycerin. Like nitroglycerin, amyl nitrate is still used today to treat heart disease, though its use has declined due to the widespread use of nitrate compounds.
compounds as recreational club drugs known as poppers. The similar physiological effects of nitroglycerin and amyl nitrate led some scientists to speculate that the element nitrogen was key to the mechanism of action. However, it would not be until the 1970s that this connection was fully understood. In 1977, pharmacologist Farid Murad and his colleagues at the University of Virginia discovered that nitroglycerin and similar compounds worked by stimulating the release of a substance they termed endothelium-derived relaxing factor, or EDRF. While the team initially expected EDRF to be a large, complex organic molecule, to their surprise, the mystery substance turned out to be something far simpler – nitric oxide or NO. This humble and irritating gas, normally encountered as an air pollutant, is a powerful vasodilator, and it's used by the body as a signaling molecule to a wide variety of biological processes, including the regulation of blood vessels and heart rate. Nitro compounds like nitroglycerin and amyl nitrate are converted by the body into nitric oxide, accounting for their vasodilating effect. In 1988, Murad, Robert Fergot, and Louis Ignaro, who made the same discovery independently, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and medicine. The discovery of nitric oxide and its pivotal role in human psychology kicked off a revolution in pharmacology, with drug companies racing to develop compounds that could exploit this metabolic pathway to treat hypertension, angina, and other cardiovascular diseases. Among these was seldinafil, developed by pharmaceutical giant Pfizer in the early 1990s. Seldinafil, which works by inhibiting an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, or PDE5, had proven moderately effective at regulating blood pressure in animals and was approved for preliminary clinical trials in 1993. Unfortunately, the drug proved less effective in humans, requiring multiple doses every day to have any sort of effect and giving certain test subjects severe muscle aches. According to lead researcher Ian Ostelow, Pfizer was about to pull the plug on the study when a particularly observant nurse noticed something strange when the male participants came in to be examined, they tended to lie down on their stomachs. The nurse soon discovered why. They were all hiding uncontrollable erections. In most mammals, an erection is accomplished not by the tensing, but rather the relaxation of muscles, allowing blood to flow into and engorge the erectile tissue of the corpus cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. The relaxation, in turn, is triggered by the release of nitric oxide. By complete accident, the observant nurse had discovered that the nitric oxide released by seldifinil was acting not as expected upon the blood vessels of the heart, but rather those of the subject's one-eyed trouser snakes. Recognizing an unfulfilled medical need, Pfizer abandoned its hypertension research and began studying seldifinil as a treatment for erectile dysfunction. Initial studies which involved subjects watching erotic videos while a special device measured the girth and hardness of their penis yielded promising results, leading to further trials involving more than 300 subjects from the UK, Sweden, and France. In nearly every case, it FNR proved significantly more effective than the placebo. After four years of testing, the compound was approved by the FDA for the treatment of erectile dysfunction, and in 1998 it hit the market under the brand name Viagra. And the rest, as they say, is history. So if you ever need a hand in that department, be sure to thank Alfred Nobel, William Murrell, Ian Osterloch, and the others for helping you add a little bang to your buck. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.